Okay, uh, I'm waiting for more people to begin the, the to join the session. Okay, everybody, how hi, how are you? I'm Gina Olivares, and thank you so much for being here for our last seminar of the semester. Uh, thank you so much to Professor Gulf to to accept our invitation. He was really really nice. And now our moderator is going to be Daniel Sagun from UNAM, and he's going to introduce uh, Professor Gulf uh, properly. So Daniel, you have the mic. Thank you so much, everybody, and see you. Oh, remember, guys, you can submit your questions uh, in the chat, and Daniel will uh, at sometimes will stop Professor Gulf to to ask the the questions. So Daniel, now you have the mic, please. Uh, see you later, guys. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's very exciting for me to present both as a speaker for closing our series of seminar of the um, of the DICU. So I will tell you a, a few things about both, and then I will uh, give the microphone to him. Uh, he did his PhD in the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. After that, he went to to Serge Harosh to make a, a postdoctoral position. And after that, with uh, in Paris, and then he went to Amsterdam with uh, George Weldraven. Uh, after that, he was a, a recipient of an excellence grant of the uh, European Union, the Marie Curie Excellence Grant. And there was when he was appointed a uh, principal researcher in, in, in Crete. Uh, uh, there, he has been a principal researcher for already. How many years, Bob? Six years? Oh, oh, almost, 15, much, yeah, more. almost 15. 15 years, Terrible. yes. Well, it's a long time. Uh, it's, uh, um, and finally, the experiments are working and are working very nicely. So he will talk to us about, uh, I hope, about the interferometer, uh, in, among so many Indeed, other things. Uh, so, Please, I, I won't say anything else, and please both take the mic and tell us about what's happening with the and matter waves. Mm -hmm. So, uh, first of all, I would like to thank very, very much thank uh, Daniel for uh, arranging this, and uh, Gina for for uh, inviting me. It's a great honor to speak uh, to your society. I have very, very, very fond memories of uh, coming to to Mexico and uh, to. Um, Cancun for a conference and then also visiting UNAM. That's the only part of the um, of the Mexican uh, landscape, quantum landscape uh, close by. And I was really, really impressed by the, the atmosphere you have over there, by the, the friendliness, the cooperation spirit and the, uh, the level of, of general level of physics that's being done there. It was a, a very, very fond memories. So um, I lost my talk there. Um, so I'm going to present to you the, our latest uh, results from the uh, from our uh, from our research group. Uh, where are we? We are in Europe, of course, in the very bottom right corner of Europe. So down here, I presume. Let me see. Ah, oh, there they are. You can see the meeting controls. They're very well hidden for me. A moment, sorry to drag them to some other, I can actually see them so that I can annotate. The annotation is gone. Ah, oh, there it is, maybe. Um, oh, it seems I cannot do that, but uh, never mind. So, um, uh, there. Uh, you can see my mouse, right? Daniel, yes. can you see my mouse? Okay, great. Yeah, we can see it. Um, yes, we can see your mouse. So, um, my mouth, mouse and my mouth, uh, mouse and mouse. Uh, so, okay, so we are in Europe, in the bottom, bottom right corner of Europe, far away from the center, where it's nice and warm. And Crete is normally more associated with, uh, well, less associated with this, but this is what uh, it looks like close to our institute in January, sometimes. Uh, I've actually been up there with Daniel once, it's a, it's a wonderful place. Down in Iraq, it of course looks more like this here most of the time. So we have fantastic beaches, but most importantly, we also have some very, very good uh, 
uh, lab spaces. So this is a beach uh, close by in, uh, in March. And the little person here is my aunt who came to visit. So you can have some fantastic time there. But uh, it's also a good place to do physics. Dangerous place, as you can see. Uh, no, he did not injure his arms in the uh, working in the lab, but on a motor scooter. He's the most unlike, unlucky person that I know. But one of the more lucky persons is this one, whom you might recognize. So that is uh, Daniel, when he was um, when he was a postdoc in, in our group. Uh, we have a very colorful combination of nations here at times. So Mark, uh, he was also a postdoc. He's now running a, a group in, in Australia. He's Australian. Daniel from Mexico. Uh, Michael Morrissey from Ireland. Gustav Wickstrom from uh, Denmark, uh, Sweden, sorry. Uh, uh, Paul Condine is from uh, the UK. He's now in Malaysia. Uh, so very big, and, and of course some important Greeks as well. Me as a semi-Greek. I'm German uh, by nationality, but I'm living here since such a long time that uh, when I think of my country, I often, often Greece comes to mind first. So um, this is more of a team that has done the work that I'm going to present here, notably these three people here. So that's uh, Yanis Trukakis, he's our current, he's just finishing his PhD. Uh, Sora Pandey, who has finished some time, it's now in Los Alamos. And uh, Hector Mas, who is now in, also in the United States. And that is Yorgos Vasilakis, who is uh, now has been elected as a researcher in our lab. And of course, uh, we're always looking for PhD and postdocs. So if any bright PhD student is, 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 is listening right now, I'm very, very interested and I have open positions and very exciting stuff going on. Uh, new projects starting, which are nicely financed and are badly in need of good people to join. So please, please, please contact me and yeah. So right now, actually, our, my, our group is largely Indian. So we have three Indians now in the group. So it fluctuates a lot. Anyway, matter wave interferometry. That is really the key, key equation that's in there. So it's actually, it's, 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 it's surprisingly easy. What you have is you have, you have to split your atoms into two different states or photons or anything. And if these two states have an energy difference, so U2 minus U1, then you divide that by, uh, by AH bar, that gives you an angular frequency times time, that gives you a phase. And that's the phase difference between the two states. So if you recombine them, then you have, a, in, in a phase sensitive fashion, then the outcome of the combination will depend on the integral of the energy difference over time. Great. So what does that mean actually? Well, it means that if I just take an, a, a rubidium atom and I lift it only by one nanometer, Right? I mean, one nanometer, ten, 10 times its own radius only, for just one second, then I get 13 radians difference in uh, between the two phases. So that's enormous. So for very, it measures very, very small uh, differences in, uh, in, in, in energy, very, very efficiently. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is this. This is an optical table. It's from uh, Bloch, Emanuel Bloch in, 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 um, in, in Max Planck Institute in Munich. If you want to do matter wave interferometry, the, uh, the optics, the experiment can become very, very complex. But uh, so why would you want to do that? Go through the pain. Why do precision measurements at all? So let me give you an example from, uh, from uh, Stockholm. So in 1951, a flight from Stockholm to Japan took 55 hours. Just a few years later, it took only 35. Well, that's kind of strange. I and mean, did they invent a new rocket engine? No. The key invention was what you see this uh, Peterson, in our Peterson looking, look into, is just a gyroscope. The man invented, it's a, he's a pilot actually, and he invented and designed and, and had manufactured a gyroscope that would allow the planes to fly over the, the, the North Pole. So the problem was, if you look down, if you fly over the North Pole, what you see is just a white mass, no landscape, nothing. You cannot know where you are. 
If it's cloudy, you can't see the stars. So you don't know where you're flying to. So if you take a little bit of a left turn, well, you can fly very nice circles for a very long time and then die. If you have a gyroscope, however, that keeps true for I mean, many hours, then you just follow your gyroscope, you don't see anything, and eventually arrive in America, or Japan in this case. So it's a huge difference. Another example is this year. This year is, uh, this is Gabon. Gabon has now the second uh, uh, president who has the same name uh, as his father, who is also president. So the two together have been ruling the country since I think 50 years. And of course, everywhere we have a decent dictatorship, you also have oil. Of course, not everywhere there's, where there's oil, there's a dictatorship. But um, they, have, uh, they, have oil, they, they have oil there. So this is a place in the jungle where they used oil. Where do, how do you find oil? Well, you take, uh, you take, make a map, you take explosives, you explode little bombs on the ground, the ground shakes. Uh, you put microphones everywhere, you, remember the, you measure the shaking, and if underneath is rock, then the sound is nicely reflected. If it's sand, it's damped. If it's oil, it gets, it wobbles and you can hear the echo. So they made a map, so you see here, they saw the yellow bits being the wobbly bits. So then they know, knew there must be oil underneath there. They drilled where the cross is here, and what did they find? Nothing. So that's bad. If an oil company drills, does all the trouble and doesn't find oil, that's, that's bad. So what does a company do that's stuck and doesn't know what to do anymore? And the engineers are at a loss. Whom do you call? The physicists. So the physicists, uh, they ask the physicists and the physicist company they ask is Archex. It's a spin-off of Cambridge University. And what they did is they used the Meissner effect. The Meissner effect, as all of you are probably aware of, is if I put a superconductor above a magnetic field, since the flux through the, mag through the superconductor cannot change, it rejects any change in magnetic field, and so it can hover, hover above a surface. Okay, if you add to, the, to that some coils to pick up any change in magnetic, superconducting coils to pick up any change in magnetic field, plus a squid to, pay, to pick up a transformer and then a squid to pick up any change of, um, of current at the single electron level, then you can measure extremely small displacements. So you can measure extremely small changes in gravity and you can try to make a gravity map. Then you put that into a, a, a cryostat, a helium cryostat, which apparently if you're an oil company, you can get uh, even in, 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 in Africa, in the depths of the jungle. Then you put that into a vibration isolation transform platform, you put that into a plane, and you make a new map. And then you find, oh, the reason why we didn't find oil is because left we had oil, right we had oil, but we didn't have the resolution to see that. And so we drilled in the middle, and there was no oil. They drilled here, and hooray, they became rich. So this is why you want to make precision measurements. This is why it's interesting to do gravity maps. This is, this, this is, one, re this is one of the main reasons. The second reason, for example, is, uh, is water. I mean, Mexico City is using giant amounts of water and I understand at some point that, that when there are problems in getting enough water to there. So it's very important to know the water levels around. And, um, and since you don't know, the, in order to measure that, it's, it's difficult if you only measure in a few points. So you would like to have a map of the water. And so uh, gravity is a very good way to do that. And we have now space missions where we measure the gravity over Earth, and uh, which, which hence is, is a very, very important uh, thing to, in order to measure the uh, ice sheets, the water uh, resources, uh, the level of the oceans, and so forth. And all of that can be done much more precisely with cold atoms than can be done by classical means. And uh, here, actually, you see the first. Uh, one of the first missions to really measure a gravity map uh, from an airplane with cold atoms. So cold atoms, and if you this is actually much easier than with the with the Meissner. Actually, the, Me the Meissner effect and cryostat and all these uh, these electronics were so difficult to do that this project was abandoned, and they they are not doing that anymore. 
but now with cold atoms, the cold atom technology is getting there. And so we can get a much more simple thing. So you don't see a huge vibration isolation platform here. You just see a small sensor, which is just a little bit here. And this is uh, some computational stuff and in some light sources. So with that, I, for example, measured Iceland. So that's a map of Iceland. So you can see here, the red bit is, uh, I guess it's, it's, it's high gravity. It's a gravity anomaly above uh, Greenland. This is Greenland here, the outline. And so it's, it's a technology that's coming. So uh, yeah, so that's uh, our gravity measurement. Uh, but uh, if we want to do real precision measurements, then uh, this small of a distance is a problem. If we only measure very small distances, then since the height at which it drops, the, the sensitivity of an atom interferometer is scaled with t squared for reasons which I will not go into. But since it uh, scales with g uh, t squared, the height also scales. So if I want to do proper measurements, high precision measurements with, with uh, cold atoms, I need to let them drop for a very long time. And this is why, um, uh, this is why the experiments, the state of the art experiments that are doing cold atom gravimetry nowadays, uh, or cold atom, ultra high resolution cold atom experiments are becoming extremely large. So here on the left, you see one of the first ones, uh, first experiments that is in Stanford. It's a 10 meter tower in war, uh, with r rubidium atoms being shot from down here using light shot up here and then they turn and then fall back. This is the uh, Wuhan Tower, which is, uh, I think, just uh, 10, 12 meters tall, but can do three atom species and uh, incredible stuff. And this is the Hanover Tower. So they're, they're giant towers. But even that is not enough for the best experiments. So then they have, uh, in, in Germany, they have a, a 120 meter tall tower built exclusively in order to do tests at zero gravity. So this is actually a gigantic vacuum tube that can be emptied. And then you put down there in a tiny, in a, in a capsule, in a one meter tall capsule, uh, one meter 50 tall capsule, you put your experiment, you carry it up, and then you let it drop down the vacuum uh, and do your experiments, which gives you just a few seconds of, of integration time, and you can do precision measurements there. Uh, or you can go into an aeroplane where you can then uh, do parabolic flights and, and do this and do the same for longer duration but with a lot more vibration. And then there was the sounding rocket of Quantus of the German Physical Society, uh, Ernst Rasel and uh, Wolfgang Erdmer. And these people actually have produced the first BEC, Bose Einstein condensate, in space. So they've flown already there. And then there are many. Uh, that's uh, NASA CCAL, uh, CAL and CCAL, which is a, a BEC experiment performed in space. So BEC stands for Bose-Einstein condensate, and that is, um, it's a state of matter, which I guess actually everyone, most people are aware of that by now, but it's a state of matter which occurs if we cool uh, bosons to extremely low temperatures and where the uncertainty principle of the uh, position of the, uh, the, the, since we know the uh, momentum to extreme precision, the position becomes unknown or actually becomes ill-defined. And so the, this uncertainty means that many atoms fit within one uncertainty. And so they all become one single quantum object. So the quantum statistical effect. Uh, in the context of this talk, it's just a convenient, uh, uh, starting point for, for interferometric experiments. Uh, and then there are a number of proposals, ST Quest, to perform such experiments in space. So we have co proposed that with uh, various groups from Europe, uh, from uh, Bordeaux, um, Philippe Bouillet, from uh, the UK, uh, Kai Bongs, Ernst Rasel from uh, Hanover, and uh, Guglielmo Tino from Italy, from Florence. So we proposed a mission where you let uh, um, atoms, uh, two different species of atoms fall for a very long time. In orbit, of course, you can have them fall basically for infinitely long times. And uh, then you can uh, compare how these two species fall. And Einstein's equivalence principle claims that 
uh, there is no difference between different atoms. That is, and between the um, between uh, between different atoms and for um, uh, for uh, the accelerational mass and the gravitational mass being the same. Sorry, I got stuck there because the zoom was doing strange things. Um, okay, and then the, the the further space experiments which we are which we are co-proposing. But anyway, all of that is so in this year we involved on I forgot to mention this year this is on earth that is a chain of uh two uh, with two branches uh with 30 atom interferometers in each one of the arms and that is uh, an attempt or proposal to measure gravitational waves from earth and uh, similarly sage is uh, measuring gravitational waves in space using atom clocks so these are various Euro, mainly European projects, which we have, uh, which we're co part. However, the interesting thing for us is really atomtronics. So you can imagine that uh, these things here, these huge experiments. Um, well, I'm in Greece, so I pointed out that's at one end of Europe, and Greece is not exactly the richest nation in Europe. So uh, no one will pay for me to build any of these infrastructures uh, here on Crete. So we have to go smaller. And of course, if we want to make these cold atoms useful in more general context, if we want to have the, the next atom interferometer on an archeological site to carry around or uh, in an airplane uh, flying around, then really what we want is we want to hold the atoms against gravity. We don't want to have them fall. We want to hold them and, and manipulate them in similar to which uh, in atom chips in a way on a chip similar to the way to the way we manipulate currents in uh, on, a, on a chip and uh, so some people have termed this atomtronics so electronics atomtronics and so here's a little uh, like this this is the dream that we have circuits that we can have atoms flow that they can split the wave packets that they come back together and so forth a little bit and, and some of the techniques have been established now some methods and so we can use light uh, Malcolm Bouchier for example in uh, in Los Alamos he or Mark Baker in, in in the US they can they use laser beams laser beams can manipulate atoms via the AC Stark effect so you can uh, without actually absorb the atoms absorbing any of the light the ground state of the atoms can be manipulated uh, using near resonant light. So via, as I said, via the IAC structure, which is completely adiabatic. And then you can use the light to draw all sorts of shapes. And these are different shapes. And this is the, maybe the most impressive shape uh, there is in there. What you see is Einstein Bose, so Bose Einstein. But these image, these are not, this is not light really what you see. It's a shadow image of an atom distribution. So they created an atomic distribution that is, that is these two people. Of course, these are thermal atoms, so it's difficult to do any quantum mechanics with that, but it's, it's an enormous feat. Then here on the top right, you see the first atom chip or the first uh, successful atom interferometer on the chip. It's a very simple micro, uh, Michelson interferometer, which is between these two, these two mirrors. The atoms get trapped here and we do interferometry with them. Not me, uh, uh, Lina Howe back in 2005. Um, but they could only transport the atoms by something like 10 micrometers, 10, 30, maybe 50 micrometers. But these atom chips have become a very powerful, very important source of of, of research and as a means to produce count atoms and it's a very important tool. tool. So uh, how do we decide whether an atom, inter atom uh, chip is good or not? So we came up with, uh, or Malcolm Boschier in Benask in 2015 came up with criteria uh, which we called loop, they have to have a loop, they have to be smooth and they have to be dynamic, controllable. The so-called LSD criteria of uh, atomtronics. And I've put here the various uh, things together, possibilities to create them. I'm not going to get into them because it's a bit tedious, but essentially each one of these uh, uh, the methods known so far lack one of the components. 
Some of them, uh, uh, dipole traps can be very smooth, can be changed, but you cannot make a loop if it's a straight trap. If you, um, if you have, and so forth, it doesn't matter. But I'm going to propose to you time averaged adiabatic potentials, which can do uh, all of this. And the aim, as I said, is to produce something like this. To have, uh, that you can you manipulate the atoms, that you can change which way they go, and you can bring them back together, and you can make interferometers with them. Unfortunately, reality looks much more like this. So there's always roughness. Whenever you draw something, whenever you have a current, whenever you have a wire, there's always roughness. And it's unavoidable, completely unavoidable. So, um, and it's unavoidable because there will always be a rough imperfection on the scale of the wires that you make that you use in order to make the potentials. So, if, if, if uh, and hence, uh, since the wires aren't straight, well, the current doesn't flow straight, as, as some people have found, uh, the potential itself will not be straight. And so if an atom moves along the track, it will get shaken out of its waveguide. And that's very bad. So what can we do? Well, if one looks a bit more closely at, 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 um, uh, at what happens to these potentials, or any potential for that matter, then you find that as you go further away from the waveguide, the roughness the, the, of the potential drops exponentially with the distance over the wavelength, the character, characteristic wavelength at which you're looking. So if I have a one centimeter wave uh, noise that I'm looking at, then if I go one centimeter away, it drops by, okay, two pi, but um, it drops very quickly. Um, and that is that has been experimentally verified. Now, one solution would be to go very far away. So you see on these tracks on the right, you don't see any roughness, but actually you don't see any difference between the tracks either. So I would need these two wires in order to make my potential, one current flowing one way, one current flowing the other way. But if I go further away, then the difference is gone. So I can't make a potential again. So what I have to use is topology. I have to use something else to make my potential, something else to make my waveguide, something that does not depend on the wires, but on something else. And um, yeah, and uh, we have managed to do that. And we can use large coils, coils of the order of uh, yeah, 50 millimeters, five centimeters in diameter. And with that, we can create waveguides of the order of um, uh, 100 micrometers radius. So the character's wavelength that we have to look at is, let's say, 500 micrometers, which is a, a, a huge acceleration. Uh, and then, um, yeah, and so if we put that into the equation, then we get a suppression of 10 to the minus 275. Who has ever heard of a suppression factor of 275? It's enormous. So it's zero, strictly. There's nothing. There's nothing, there's nothing. I'm not claiming that we can do 275. But what I'm claiming is the roughness of the coils completely goes away. It just doesn't matter anymore. But of course, it's easy to say that. We have to demonstrate it. But let me first explain to you shortly what uh, time average, average adiabatic potential is now. And for that, if that works. Uh, so there are two there are different time scales that are involved. Uh, so what we combine is we combine radio frequency, time averaging, and quasi-DC field to create these. So um, in order to explain to you the time scales, I'm going to switch off the sharing for one moment and hopefully get it back so that you, uh, I want to see myself. Uh, Daniel, um, what? can you make me, can you, uh, can you make me big or am I big? Yeah. Am I in the main window? I am, good. Yep. So you can see me, right? Yes. So I'm going to use, uh, to show you something, uh, Daniel once gave me this, uh, a typical, I understand, a typical Mexican uh, children's toy. Valero. 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 But I'm going to use my own, which my father gave to me, which, is, uh, which is, resembles more a rubidium matter. So if you take, oops, can you see that? I can't see my hand. Okay, I'm going shorter, so like this. So quasi DC is, if you move slowly, right? So I have here, I have my atom that's in a trap. Down here is the trap. This is the, there's a string holding it. And if I move my, uh, 
my uh, my trap. If I do it slowly, well, it just follows, right? You can see that nicely. So if I go faster, so then at some point, well, it starts to oscillate. That's a trapping frequency, right? Yep. If I go even faster, then you see I'm moving. I'm not cheating. I hope you can see that. But I'm moving. I'm moving my hand very quickly. Oh, yep. someone no, no, join. No, don't worry. I can also uh, take control. Of so I can move. I can move quickly, and the atom basically doesn't move. Yep. And what it sees is the time average of my motion. So if you look, if you look very closely, you can see if I'm if I'm um, uh, don't move it. It's at this height. I move it, and it goes a little bit up. But that's the only thing. It basically doesn't move. A little bit of micro motion, but very little. And then if I move it very very rapidly, then it goes oops, and hooks up, and and that's then my RF transition. So radio frequency tradition, uh, transition. So back to the slide, hopefully. Yes, I see. already give you the permission. Yes. Go. So, um, so, um, so we have explained now quasi-static. That's when I move slowly. Then there's the trapping frequency uh, at which it moves uh, resonantly. Then I have my time averaging, which is of the order of audio frequency. So in our case, five kilohertz. So our trapping frequency is, say, anything between uh, five and uh, and the hundred hertz. Uh, audio frequency five kilohertz, and then I have the Lamo frequency, which is the frequency uh, at which the I can drive uh, transition between spin states of the atom. So MF one to MF two, the magnetic hyperfine levels. And then I can make, uh, uh, I, can, I can do adiabatic potentials. I'll explain to that in a moment, that is. And actually, so in the experiments we drive, uh, we use basically the whole experimental spectrum that you can think of. So we start the experimental repetition is about one minute, 10 seconds. The uh, quasi DC manipulation where we move around the atoms is of the order of one second to actually to 70 seconds depending. The time averaging happens, as I said, at five kilohertz. The dressing, the RF transitions at the megahertz. And we also drive hyperfine transitions at 6.8 gigahertz. And then the optical detection at 14 megahertz. At 14, G, uh, 14 uh, at 780 nanometers. The first bits, all of these are hooked up to one atom clock, so they're all phase coherent to be controlled. All the way up to the microwave, we can we can control phase and amplitude of all of our waves. So experimentally, it's rather challenging, but it can be done. Uh, Daniel can tell you about the pain that it sometimes causes, but yes, it, 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 we're managing that. So dress potential, the adiabatic transition. So this is now the B field is horizontal, energy vertical, and this shows uh, the magnetic hyperfine states. So we have minus one and a half, plus one and a half. In rubidium, it's five states for us, but here we just look at, uh, we simplify that a bit. So if I then shine in a radio frequency where the photon, the frequency of the photon is, uh, is resonant with, the, uh, with this, with a gap, with a, a certain magnetic field. So if the magnetic field is resonant with the photon, then, um, then I can drive a transition. And, uh, yeah, so how do I describe that? Well, a convenient way to describe that is a, is a floquet. Oops, floquet, there we are. Floquet uh, Hamiltonian, where I shift all the energy curves infinite times up and down by just one photon. And now I get crossings, points where the, the, the blue, the minus one half state, hits the plus one half state. And if I can drive a coupling between them, which I can, because they have F states, so magnetic, an oscillating magnetic field of the right polarization can couple them. Then at the crossing point, I get an avoided crossing. And the size of the crossing now is the, uh, is the Rabi frequency that you get of, of the transition. And this, now if I use, if I, if I put a, uh, if I apply this to a quadrupole field, then Instead of plotting horizontally magnetic field, I can plot the uh, the radius. So in a quadrupole, the field increases in all directions linearly, right? 
and so I can write down uh, that means if I go from the from the middle of the, the trap outwards and I shine in a radio frequency at some field and will be resonant at, at some at some frequency then will be resonant at some uh, field and then at that point I get an uh, avoided crossing so this is a uh, this is one of those things that are easily explained with the hands and very much more difficult on a screen. So I will again stop my share for a moment and uh, show it to you. So again, I have my quadrupole field. So outwards, at any point outwards, the field increases, right? In any direction, the field increases. So if I shine in a radio frequency, then at some distance, this will be resonant. So if it's resonant there in any direction, well, that looks like a shell, right? Like a like an eggshell. So if I now take that eggshell um, and put atoms in there, well, it's cool, but it would be fantastic because I mean it's a wonderful topological object. For example, if you put a vortex into that system, then the vortex comes in, but it has to come out again. So when it comes out at the bottom, then I have this on this in in this this shell, I have two vortices, but since, since it's a shell, I can just move the vortex around. And so I can move it up and plop. They are opposite. So the net vorticity of such an object would always be zero. It's, 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 I, I'm really fascinated by, by that fact. Just because there's a hole in the middle, the net vorticity of that system is topologically always zero. It would be wonderful to see that. On Earth, however, well, we have gravity. So my wonderful little shell will turn into a cup. And a cup is boring topologically because a cup is a pancake, is a cigar, is what we can do anyway. So that's not good. I want to have a ring. I want to have a ring so that I can move my atoms around, that I can play with them, that I can do my racetrack thing, that I can do an uh, interferometer with, with an end close to the surface. So how can I do that? Well, I've shown you the, the nice trick with, the, with the, uh, my time averaging. So if I take now this shell and I move it up and down, Right? I can, it's five kilohertz. And I can do that with a quadrupole very, very easily because a quadrupole plus a homogeneous field is exactly the same quadrupole just somewhere else. So if I apply an oscillating harmonic field, it will just shake the quadrupole. And so it will shake the, the shell. And if I shake the shell, then you can, just, you can just see, I mean, here on the sides, basically nothing is happening, right? It moves up and down tangentially. At the top and the bottom, though, there, I'm moving across this, this crossing that you saw earlier on. So there, if I have time average there, there, the potential will increase. So if I increase the top and bottom and not on the sides, well, that's a ring. And so... You're going back to the presentation? You have, you, yes, you have to okay. disable me somehow. Yep. Go. So, great. I thought maybe I've spoken too long and you want to shut me up already? No, no. <laughs> so anyway, so that's our shell. Let me get a cup and time averaging gives us that. Good. So um, you can also forget about the details. You can just enjoy the nice pictures. So what we can do with that, if we, if we oscillate it uh, not only in one direction, but make a figure of eight or uh, circles or whatever, then we can make all these, these nice little figures uh, at least in theory. The most interesting one is though the ring, and the ring we, can sh we could even shine multiple frequencies and do concentric or stacked rings, which we should be able to couple to each other. And there's fantastic things that we hope one day we will be able to do. So students, listen, if you want to do some of that stuff, here it is. Uh, but we have to find time and, and so forth. But the best thing about this ring is it works. So what you see here is a BAC, a Bose-Einstein condensate in a ring, loaded into a ring. And we have here about uh, 300,000 atoms at a temperature of something like three nano Kelvin with a diameter of one millimeter. And this is a really, it's a real image. This is an absorption image, okay, with false color to make it prettier. But it's a real uh, experimental image. The background is just noise. The dots you see in the background is just the camera noise. Um, so what can we do with that? Well, how do we do it? We first make a mod, then we go to a quadrupole trap, then we load uh, the, it, uh, the atoms into a dipole trap uh, using a, a far resonant laser. There we create a BAC, 
and then we load the BSC into the ring. And the picture that you see here is again in the trap, in the ring-shaped trap this time. Uh, again, the, the, the BSC, this time a BSC. Uh, and how do we keep them on one side? Well, we can just tilt the trap a little bit, so we can change the orientation of our modulation field. And we tilt it, and then gravity pulls it to one side. So it's, and if you want to, it's a, a gravitomagnetic uh, time average trap or something like that. But anyway, that's it. How do we know it's a BSC? Well, we can look at it. And so that's an, it's just a cut across it, and we see that's the background. And then we see there's a tail, which is from a, a Gaussian tail, but there's a very clear, very big spike in the middle, which is the BSC. So it's a BSC. It's a Bose-Einstein concert, including its, its thermal flow. Now uh, we can accelerate it. And uh, what we use for that is uh, the bang-bang th uh, scheme of optimal control theory. A uh, very big word, but it just means that you, uh, you can, you can uh, if you do your acceleration carefully in a harmonic trap, then you can uh, displace the atoms or the harmonic oscillator a little bit to one side, so that forces that, it, it, that creates a force which pushes it back to the center of the trap. If you then accelerate the trap, then you can completely counterbalance that force. And that means that the atoms, if you include both the displacement and the acceleration, the two cancel completely and the atoms are like, they're not in, in, in the center of mass of the uh, position of the moving trap, the atoms are not, don't see any force. It's not quite Wolf, not very uh, well explained. Yeah? May I make a question? Uh, I believe the step from three to four should be quite tricky. Could you tell us? Uh, from four to five. No, it's actually, it's, it's the, the acceleration or the loading? No, the loading, the loading to the ring. The loading is amazing. I mean, I thought it would be difficult. It is incredibly easy. You overlap the two traps, you, you slowly ramp off the, the dipole trap, you just ramp up the, 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 uh, the, the uh, tap trap at the same time, and that's it. It's done. Wow. Okay. It's, it's very, very easy. It's, it, it's loss, I, I mean, it's, it's amazing because it's, it's basically loss free. We don't lose any atoms, we don't heat it. I mean, we're talking 10% or something here. It's 90%, 95% efficient. I have no idea, I mean, yes, it's a BSC, yes, collision rates are very high. So, um, I mean, you know, like, uh, you can be adiabatic either in the air and fast sense or in the thermodynamic sense. So in the air and fast sense, all quantum states always stay separate from all other quantum states. Uh, so the levels, the energy levels are all well separated. And no change in time is fast compared to the energy, uh, well, H bar over the energy splitting, right? That's the air and fast sense, so the quantum mechanical sense. But it can also be uh, adiabatic in the um, thermodynamic uh, um, sense, which means that uh, you are, any change is slow compared to the thermalization time. In that case, everything stays adiabatic. That is reversible and without increase in, en in entropy. Temperature might change because you change the volume, but it's reversible. And that's really, it, it just works. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, uh, the acceleration is also, oops, there we are. Uh, the acceleration is, 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 as I said, it's always relatively easy. If you, if you ever look at the, at the building sites where they have uh, some of these very tall cranes, have a look how they move the, the, their loads. They do exactly the same without knowing that it has a fantastic title which gave it someone a PRA. Uh, okay, so what does it look like? Well, the atoms go dunk, 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 and we accelerate them. And because I'm already way behind with my talk, let's accelerate them a bit faster. Uh, so, okay, now th these are different acceleration rates, just to show to you that we can do that. And then, of course, they follow, or not of course, but the way we do it in this optimal control way, uh, they, the, uh, the uh, position increases quadratically because the, it's the uh, because, okay, now I lost it. There we are. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, the, it's parabolic and it works nice. That's just the only thing. So, uh, and then if we go, 
it goes on and on and on. And again, I don't want to bore you with that. And goes on forever. So here you see uh, uh, the black dots are experimental points where we measure the position in the ring. The red is a fit to it, and it just it fits. I mean, there's no there's no variation. So if I even uh, if I if I look then after five seconds, I see again a BEC, and actually it's the same BEC, it's it's the same heating rate that I would get without any acceleration at all. So we're accelerating an atom, we're moving it over almost 10 centimeters during that time, 17, uh, no, I'm confused, two centimeters, 1.7 centimeters. Uh, compare, and we get zero heating. Whereas beforehand, with the microchips, they moved by 10 micrometers and lost their coherence. So it's, it's I mean, it is perfectly smooth. So when I said beforehand that one gets a, a suppression of roughness by two by e to the power of minus 270 it's true i mean we don't see any heating so suddenly we go from uh, you cannot move your bsc over any any larger distance to you can go as far as you want just do whatever you feel like and it stays a nice bsc uh, and uh, one of the very very surprising aspects of this is that the velocity at which we are mo moving is enormously fast compared to the BSC. So we are actually at Mach 17. So we're going 17 times faster than the velocity of sound. Now, if you move a BC very slowly, it's a superfluid and it can, it can avoid obstacles and even roughness doesn't matter too much. But if you move uh, a little bit faster than a superfluid velocity, any roughness will start to destroy the condensate. It will cause excitations in the condensate. And here at Mark 17, yeah, I mean, we still don't see anything. And we don't see anything in between either. So there is no, we just don't see any roughness. It's just completely not there. So what I can do is, uh, I mean, what I can, it's supposed perfectly smooth. So what I can also do is I can just look at the error. I mean, the fit is not absolutely perfect. OK, that's what we just said. The fit is not absolutely perfect. That plot came out horrible, but never mind. Um, the fit might not be absolutely perfect, but uh, there is a residual. But if I look at that residual, I can do again do a fit to the residual, and it corresponds to an oscillation of the atoms in the moving trap. And I can do a fit of that, and uh, you need a number of frequencies to do that, for reasons that doesn't matter now. But it fits perfectly and it's perfect and standard and could be actually almost completely uh, suppressed. And anyway, the amplitude is only something like 17 millivolt. And yeah, it could be suppressed by a couple of, well, at least one or two orders of magnitudes too, by using various tricks. It doesn't matter. So, uh, uh, yeah, so this, this shows actually, uh, this shows one of the advantages of the. Um, of why it is good to move the atoms around. Now that we know that it is perfectly smooth, that it doesn't excite anything, uh, it allows us to time average out any variation in the potential. So what I cannot avoid, I can, it's not roughness, I don't have roughness on the potential, but it can be bent a little bit. So the potential here on one side of the ring is a little bit deeper on these two sides of the, pot of, of the ring than on, the, on these two. So it's a, it's a the first uh, two uh, um, cylindric harmonics are present. The third already is completely suppressed in the static trap. In the time average trap, the atoms are moving so quickly around that they simply do not see this. It's time averaged out. And so we can create rings which are flat down to the picocalvin level. So it's an object where the energy between one side and the other is of the order of of just a few picocalvin. So that there should be interesting physics with barriers that one can do with uh, looking at the dynamics in such a system. Um, to give that, to give, to, to put that in some energy scale that one would normally encounter, this is, if, if, if I try to do it in a static way, then I would have to make this ring flat in space to two nanometers height over a distance of one millimeter. 
that will be extremely difficult to do. Uh, uh, Wolf, I have yeah. a question. I have a question here uh, from Eduardo Gomez. Yeah. And it is, is there any wave packet expansion? Uh, yes, there is actually. Um, um, yes, there is. And we are, we are working on actually, we are, we are putting the final touches on a paper on this, which I, I'm not going to present here. But um, so uh, the way we get the atoms into the ring is we load them to one side and we accelerate them and then we let them expand in the ring. So this does not make a perfect condensate actually. What it does is it's an expanding wave packet. So it's a wave packet, it's still a BC, it still is coherent, but it, 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 it wraps back onto itself. And uh, what we've done is we've, we've created a, a gravitomagnetic lenses inside this waveguide. So the atom, the wave packet moves around in this gravitomagnetic trap. We can switch off that trap in the azimuthal direction, azimuthal direction, not the radial confinement, not the vertical confinement, just along the ring. We switch off the trap. The atoms expand either because they're thermal, and that just the thermal motion, or if it's a Bose-Einstein condensate, it has self-interaction energy, which is uh, which looks mathematically exactly like a chi-3, like light in a chi-3 material. Um, and so the self-interaction makes it spread. And then what we do is we apply another uh, gravitomagnetic field, which looks like a lens, and so we can refocus it and let it expand again or collimate it inside that ring. But yes, the wave packets do expand and uh, for interferometry, that is an, an issue, and that one has to take care of very carefully. I, just, I, hope yeah, that I, I want to make to take the opportunity to ask another question. Uh, yeah. I remember you were uh, thinking about black scattering as an uh, accelerating mechanism. What happened with that? Are we still we're, we're still working on that? Um, I will show a little bit of one slide in the very end. So we are looking at uh, so. Um, so we have now this perfectly smooth waveguide. Uh, so it would be very interesting to figure out what's in between. So we're now at minus 200, uh, minus e to the 200, whatever. I mean, I'm not, don't take that number serious. And it, it's not a physical number, but we are somewhere where there is no, we, there's just nothing visible in terms of roughness. Uh, and on the atom chips, it's so rough, we can't move at all. So it would be very interesting to explore the, 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 the range, range in between. So what I would like to do, or what, or what we have already started doing, is put artificial barriers into the, uh, into, the, into the ring and look first at the heating induced by them. So if the atoms pass it many times, if, I mean, eventually, if the barrier is big enough, it will scatter some of the atoms. It will impart some of the energy of the barrier onto the atoms. And you will see that it uh, that it starts to 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 heat, uh, and there are some very interesting effects. Uh, we see some thresholds, and there's very interesting stuff. Going on. If the barrier is very large, then you could also get reflection, and we do see reflection in some cases, and we completely do not understand what's going on there. We need to do these experiments much more carefully than we have done, but we have seen uh, reflection total reflection from a barrier, from an attractive barrier. When I talk barriers, I don't mean, I don't mean something that increases the energy, but it's, it's more like a, a pothole in the street. So we see complete reflection from uh, the pothole, but we don't really, the type, the, 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 uh, we don't understand this yet, well, uh, what's happening there. Good, um, so continuing. Uh, with the talk, unless there's another question, maybe no. Good. So, uh, so we can manipulate these atoms in there. So we can create a, first a flat ring, nice flat ring. We can make a waveguide where we have a, a particle going around. The shape of this here is one where we accelerate it in a non-perfectly adiabatic way, so it looks a bit more like a yin yang uh, running around. We can use the polarization of the radio frequency. We can tilt it using gravity and we can move it around. Uh, the polarization, interesting enough, allows us to manipulate two different 
spin states of the atoms in completely, uh, well, with the polarization in opposite way, but with polarization and gravity in together in arbitrary way. So we can take a we can take an atom sample, we can give it a radio a, a microwave pulse, which splits it into two uh, hyperfine states. We can then manipulate these hyperfine states. Um, but we have not gone much beyond demonstrating a manipulation. We've not explored the uh, coherence in these systems yet. Good. Uh, oh yeah, and that is actually this expansion. So I shouldn't, I forgot that I had that slide in there. So on the left hand side here, you see what happens if I just switch off the azimuthal confinement. So free expansion in the atomic ring shaped waveguide. And on the right hand side, uh, you see what happens if we apply also a delta kick pulse. That is this magnetic lens that I just mentioned. So we can do it uh, again. So you can see one expands very rapidly, the one without the magnetic lens, gravito magnetic lens, and this one is with the magnetic lens. So we can clearly focus very nicely. Um, and the resulting uh, temperatures are enormously different. So if we focus or collimate the sample, then we get down to two nano Kelvin temperature. That is not, that's uh, two nano Kelvin equivalent kinetic energy because of BAC, so it doesn't have a temperature. But uh, here the, chem the kinetic energy corresponds to 2 nano Kelvin, whereas here it's 40, uh, 50 nano Kelvin. So it's a very efficient, we can really manipulate the atomic sample in there. Um, uh, yeah, okay, that we will overlook. So uh, let me summarize. Uh, so we, we have now a, a matter wave accelerator ring, like a little low energy mini CERN accelerator. Um, we can have we have demonstrated lossless hypersonic flow of BECs. We have reached ultra high magnetic uh, angular momentum. So we're talking here about forty thousand h bar per atom. So enormously high ranges. Uh, we've demonstrated delta k cooling. So uh, gravito magnetic lenses, matter wave optics inside the ring. We can do state dependent control of multi component BECs. And uh, our next goals are to look at obstacles, at interferometry, and, and yeah, and interferometry. And so, uh, yeah, and we're also working on non destructive uh, uh, detection techniques for atoms that sub, uh, sub shot noise atom number preparation of thermal clouds and BACs. That's another project going on. Um, and we also have some other topics which we've expanded into lately, uh, cavity optics uh, with photons and uh, uh, designing and demonstrating some optical components for space missions uh, for cold, ultra cold atoms again. And actually, I think uh, we better stop. Thank you very much. Thanks, Wolf. Um... I uh, want to ask if there are any other questions before we close. Um, yes, everybody out there, please, if you feel that you cannot make the, the question in, in English, you can do it in Spanish and Daniel or I can translate. Uh, I don't know if Professor Wolf has more five uh, five more minutes to stay with, um, with us for. I'm a... very 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 happy to answer any okay. question needed. Okay. So before. One of the nice... uh -huh. Yeah, go ahead. One of, one, of, one of the nice things of Zoom is I'm just a few meters away from my bed, so. Ah. <laughs> go forever. Yeah, that's great. But before we go to the live questions, so can everybody can ask the questions uh, by themselves. Eduardo uh, was going to give an announcement. Uh, Eduardo, if you want to do the announcement that you told me, and then we proceed to the more every last part of the talk. Ah, okay, there was another question by Eduardo. Okay. Maybe he can make it himself. Yeah, you can make it yourself, Eduardo, please. Okay, okay. <laughs> so the, the question is, uh, uh, this, this, this beautiful ring, you can also use it to trap ther thermal atoms. So my question mm -hmm. is, uh, uh, what do you see as the advantage of uh, going all the way to a BEC? 
for for your measurements? Yeah, good. Uh, we um, it's a good, it's a very good question. So uh, in some cases, actually, probably thermal atoms have uh, considerable advantages. So maybe, maybe uh, I should start by saying the disadvantage of using BAC. One is it's a little bit more difficult, but it, the difference is not gigantic. The difficulty is to get atoms in there at all. Uh, once you have atoms in dipole trap enough, it's not so difficult to get a BAC. Um, but BACs are very dense objects. So the atom atom interaction does become considerable in these objects. And, um, and uh, so just like I said, like the Chi-3 medium, you get self-interaction. And so if you, if you want to do, for example, uh, matter wave interferometry, then the, if, if you split the atom sample in the beam splitter, which you need in any interferometer, the two sides of the interferometer will always be, um, uh, will have a, a Poissonian uh, distribution in atom number. So if I split 100 atoms, then I get not 50, 50, I get 50, 5, 45, whatever. I get a, I get a variance of 10 on this. So, uh, 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 so the, that then translates via the self-interaction into an energy difference, which destroys my interferometer because when I'm measuring the self, the, uh, the energy difference due to the self-interaction between the two arms, which on principle grounds is unknown and unpredictable and different from shot to shot. So the contrast goes to zero. So that means uh, using atoms, many atoms in a BC is a problem. In a thermal cloud, the atoms are more separated, they don't interact so much. If I can prevent them from bouncing into each other, then I can measure. So that's good. On the other hand, uh, a BSC is an extremely controllable sample. So to put that into the ground, more, uh, ground state of the confinement in the radial direction is relatively easy. So I don't have to worry about many of these aspects. So, yeah, the, the, the judges are still out on what's going to be the best thing for an interferometer. For more fun bits of looking at uh, the wave packet move around for interference effects uh, in, uh, for flux quantization and all these games, of course, the BSC is the fun thing to, to work with. It's the interesting, the interesting quantum thing to have. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Roberto, if you want to give the, the announcement, uh, we keep going. Uh, probably not to interrupt the, the, the ah, okay. spirit. Okay. I would prefer later. to have the questions first and then, then later we, we. Okay, so anybody else who wants to ask a question or comment something, you can go ahead. You have the mics open. Somebody? Okay, I can, I can do another, I can make another question. <laughs> Uh, so it's very exciting to see all this happening after so many years. Um, both, uh, what is the limitation for in distance for the atoms to go around? Like, uh, is 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 that the lifetime of the of the BAC or? So for the current trap, it is the lifetime of the BAC, uh, but that is limited. Probably mainly by, um, it's a good question, I don't know actually. It's, uh, um, so yeah, I, I don't know, I don't actually know what kills the BC in this case. Uh, it is likely to be three body recombination, at least initially. Uh, so yes, probably, probably there's three body recombination. So if, you, if a BC is, is, is gets too dense, so the two body combination doesn't matter because two body, uh, two body condition cannot uh, cause a spin flip. If you have three bodies, it can cause a spin flip. And that's, that's typically how BSC dies. Uh, the potential itself, we have not seen any heating, so that's not it. Um, so, um, and the size of the ring doesn't really matter. The speed could be much larger. Okay. the, the for a given for a given uh, for a given lifetime, it is hence the speed at which you can turn, which is limited by the 
century, uh, the, the maximum centripetal force that is available, which is the which is determined by the magnetic gradient of the quadrupole. So, in other words, we can't go in this system. We cannot go much much further or faster than this. What we're doing right now. Okay, there's another question from Luis Lopez. Uh, he's asking, could you put two rings going around opposite direction and collide them? Yeah, that would be cool. Uh, the answer is, in principle, yes. Uh, in practice, yes, no, the answer is yes, we could. We haven't done it. And as with anything, it is working out the details is, is the tricky bit. But uh, by applying multiple radio frequencies, we could make uh, concentric rings. Um, and once you have concentric rings, then you can imagine that if you put a condensate on both sides of the ring, so I can like this, you can see that, or you can't. Uh, okay, on two sides of the ring. Uh, if I then tilt the ring uh, around the axis between the two places where I put the atoms, then, uh, then the atoms will both flow towards each other, but miss each other because they're in separate waveguides. And then I could keep on rocking that, that, uh, that thing in order to accelerate them and then eventually collide them. So yes, it's possible, but it, it takes some acrobatics. <laughs> so if he has a good idea why to do that, cool. In, within one ring, it would actually be a nice thing to, to look at for ultra cold collisions. So it would give us a means to control collisions, the collision velocities on a nano Kelvin range, on a, a centimeters per second range. Uh, ah, and, and Luis is asking whether you need postdocs. Yeah, <laughs> I don't pay very well because I'm in Greece, <laughs> but yes, I do need postdocs. Well, part of the payment is to be in Crete. <laughs> yeah. It's very nice. But uh, we're, we're starting a new experiment, uh, not only on the rings, but to, um, to perform real meta wave optics, to use and to make, a, to create a, a phase image of, uh, in an atom cloud, and then image that cloud in the, the meta wave itself, not the, not the light, the meta wave itself, through a series of magnetic lenses onto a substrate in order to, to demonstrate meta wave optics. So I have uh, my current, one of my current pet projects is to uh, completely map optics, I mean to make meta wave optics just like normal optics, both in theory and in practice. It's a, it's a cool one. I, I'm, I'm very much looking, I'm enjoying that a lot. So yes, we need people for that. We have money, we have a, we have a European Union, Union Fed grant to do that. So we have a million euros to, to build a new experiment and uh, are terribly behind because of COVID. Oh. Yes, that's happening in all the labs. Yeah. So we are actually since weeks again in the shutdown. Uh, my children are at home uh, only uh, we're only allowed a uh, few people allowed in the lab and uh, yeah generally the whole atmosphere has it's, it doesn't feel it's not very competitive at the moment all is very yeah. slow okay guys anybody else who have a question uh, i have a, a professor blas rodriguez says thank you and that you did a great talk uh, thank you uh, it was a great pleasure yeah anybody else guys don't be shy. If you want, you can ask in Spanish. We can translate. I can, I, I can probably even understand a little Spanish because I understand Italian. So Yeah, we probably. I can, I yeah. Can even so, anybody else? Nope. Nope. Well, I think uh, that's it. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel. And thank you, thank you so much, Professor Wolf for accepting Great pleasure. our invitation. I, yes. And I very much hope that at some time in the future, I can come ag again and initiate uh, more for collaboration and inversely that uh, many of you can come to Crete to visit our labs. Oh, okay. That, that